hot. I'm gonna go eat that snow at the top. Do you think I'm crazy? I've done all this before. Just to clarify, I wasn't really eating the dirty snow, I was actually just scooping it up to put it in my hat to cool down. But what was I doing on top of a mountain in the snow in Wyoming anyway? Well, that's because of a couple little races called Western States and Hard Rock. Popcorn's ready. Now every year when deciding which races to do, I base it around making sure I have a qualifier for both Hard Rock and Western States. Western States has over 200 qualifying races to pick from. Hard Rock, on the other hand, only has 29 qualifying races, soon to be 28 actually, and they're all tough mountain races of 100 miles or more. So the first thing I did to trim the list down was cross off all of the races outside North America, not in the budget. Also not in the budget, any 200 mile races. I can also cross off Hard Rock, as I would have had to have finished it, and Whistler Alpine Meadows, as it actually wasn't on the list when I was picking races, and it has since been cancelled permanently. So that left me with 13 races to pick from. Now, I'd rather do a race I haven't done before, so I could cross off Cruel Jewel, Fat Dog, Wasatch, and Grindstone. Now, I was already registered for a local 100 miler in September, so I could cross those off. Even August was cutting it too close. So that left me with Bighorn in Wyoming, High Lonesome in Colorado, and Cascade Crest in Washington. All three races are qualifiers for both Hard Rock and Western States, but one difference was High Lonesome and Cascade Crest both had their own lotteries just to get in, but Bighorn, I could sign up right away. So, looks like I was going to Wyoming. Now, Bighorn's always been near the top of my list anyway. Ever since I heard that story about race leader Carl Melcher being chased by a moose near the top, I thought, that sounds like a lot of fun. I mean, really, what are the odds that I'm going to see a moose on the course anyway? Well, now it's time to pick some lead-up races and start training. Now, I knew I needed to train for some big hills, so... Yeah, my training was a little unorthodox, but it got the job done. As for races, first I headed off to Pennsylvania for the very hilly Heiner Challenge 50K in late April. Two weeks later in May, it was the Rugged Raccoon 25K day race in the afternoon, followed up by the 25K night race that evening. Three weeks after that was Sulphur Springs 50 mile, and three weeks later I'd be off to Wyoming for Bighorn. So, with training complete and lead-up races done, it was time to head off to Wyoming. Now's the time to grab some popcorn. Go ahead, I'll wait. No, I won't. The Bighorn Trail Run takes a little while to get to. It starts up in northern Wyoming near the town of Dayton. The place to stay is in nearby Sheridan, which is where the check-in and pre-race meeting are located, along with all the hotels. The easiest way to get there would be to fly right into the airport in Sheridan. So, I flew into Denver, a short seven-hour drive away. As I left the Rockies in my left side mirror and headed north into nothingness, this gave me lots of time to think about things like how much my ass hurt from sitting for so long or how much I was spending on gas when I could have been there already. But eventually, I arrived in Sheridan and I was off to find my resort. So I'm finally at my hotel in Sheridan, Wyoming. I think this is part of a French hotel chain. It's called Super 8, which I believe translates into Super 8. We got a train yard right behind us. I think it was inspired by my cousin Vinny. Really, I just need a place to sleep. Tomorrow I'll get up, go check out some of the trail, and then the check-in is tomorrow afternoon. Uh, Pre-race meeting tomorrow night, and that's all in the town of Sheridan where I'm staying here. Friday morning, get up and race.
In the morning, it was time to head up into the mountains for a little look-see. The race starts just west of Dayton, with a steep climb up into the Bighorn Mountains before dropping down into a valley, then a long climb up to the turnaround point at Jaws Trailhead. We then head back the same way, but run past where the start area was and finish in the town of Dayton. So it's 48 miles on the way out and 52 miles on the way back. Now as the temperatures in town started warming up, I was curious to see what the conditions would be like up at higher altitudes. So I made my way up to Jaws Trailhead. here in northern Siberia, not quite, I'm at about 9400 feet, coming up on the 50 mile turnaround. My little rental car couldn't actually make it all the way into Jaws. It was a slight uphill covered in mud and wet snow, so I had to park and hike it in. So it's definitely cooler up here. The difference is I'll be getting up here late evening and then heading back down overnight. The temperatures are going to be a lot colder overnight. Now that I knew what to expect up near 9,000 feet, it was time to head back down to 4,000 feet and check out the starting line. It was a huge difference down here with temperatures in the 90s. Now I had all the info I needed to finalize the plan for my drop bags. The course has 22 aid stations round trip, and you can leave a drop bag at each of the three major aid stations. So the plan was this. After starting at 4,200 feet, there's a steep climb early on up to 7,500 feet, then I'll make my way along to Dry Fork where I could have a drop bag, but nah. At 13.5 miles, there's no need for a drop bag. Then run along some very hot ridges before dropping way down into Sally's footbridge. Here I'll have a drop bag with a change of shoes for the wet sections coming up and some warmer clothes for the evening. Then head up the 4,500 foot climb to Jaws, which should take about seven hours, so it'll get dark on the way up. Here I'll have drop bag number two with warmer clothes for the overnight descent back to Sally's, arriving around dawn the next morning. Here I'll change back into dry shoes and lighter clothes for the very hot trek back to Dry Fork, where again I'll have no drop bag. But really at this point, you're either just grabbing some munchies and moving along, or you're dead. Either way, I don't need a drop bag. Now it's time to pack my two drop bags and go get checked in. After check-in, I joined fellow Canadians Randy and Lori to watch them drink beer while they gave me a few last minute race tips. Then I checked out the town festival before heading over to the pre-race meeting. Here they would provide some last minute details and course updates, along with answering any questions people had. Then it was finally time to head back to the Super Wheat to relax and get some sleep. But I had one last thing to do. Before every big race, I take a printout of the elevation profile and I mark all of the aid stations, along with distances and anticipated times. On the other side, I write a checklist of everything I need at each drop bag so I don't miss anything. Then I cut it out, cover it with packing tape to make it waterproof, roll it up, put it in my pack, and then I can go to sleep. I wish this was my morning commute every day. starting line, but I need to park across town at the high school because you can't park at the finish line. Another runner whose family was driving back to the shuttles was kind enough to give me a ride. But first we had to wait for the local rush hour traffic to clear. Traffic in Dayton. <laughs> Turns out, Randy and Lori were camped near the starting line, and Lori was kind enough to make me a final pre-race meal. I met a few other runners, including Mike, who Randy would be pacing. 
but more on Mike later. For now, it was finally time to get going. Just walking to the start. Following the river for a few miles, we eventually branched away and started climbing a little. But it was after passing through Lower Sheep Aid Station the real climbing would begin. Climb was just over an hour and a half, I think. And then we descended a few minutes, and we're running along a few relatively flat sections along the top here. For anyone who doesn't know what goes on at these aid stations, it's basically get your bottles filled, along with ice if they have any, empty out your garbage. Uh, we have a Grab some unhealthy munchies. Always thank the volunteers. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Then make your way to the next aid station and do it all again. I knew the temperature would be in the 90s by the afternoon, but as I made my way toward Dry Fork, it was already heating up. At Dry Fork, I grabbed some food and drink, then chatted with Randy for a bit on my way out. You're doing awesome. Yeah, I feel all right. I'm about, I think it's three and a half hours, so yeah. I'm on pace. This is kind of a nasty bit of downhill, but it's not, so just take it easy on your down here. And you all right. Just, was, as you can see it, you're just going to follow this whole canyon geez. along, right? But it was a nice downhill When you come in. back, you see this from way back there. Oh, oh man. Like, yeah. Oh, jeez. So good. All right. I'll see you Jaws maybe then. Jaws. All right. Thanks, Randy. Just leaving Dry Fork, feeling good. Had some downhills coming into it, which felt good. Now we got a few, basically downhill, mostly for the next 10K or so to the next aid station. Heat hasn't been too bad. Lots of streams to dip my head in, keep myself cool. It's been okay. What are you doing? Now. While this section was mostly exposed, there were a few wooded areas to run through which provided some cover, and this was great because my calves were starting to cramp a little in the heat. Thankfully, there was an ice cold spring to help me cool down at just the right time. Last section was rough. My calf kept cramping up in the exposed areas with all the heat. Uh, a bench. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Is that all right? Coming up on what's called the wall, which is a very steep hill. I'm going to drop a few thousand feet down to a major aid station. I have a drop bag, change of shoes, have some warmer clothes for the night. A 
I was doing my best to avoid the mud puddles near the top of the wall, just because I had a different pair of shoes to wear up to Jaws in the snow, and I would put these shoes back on tomorrow morning, hopefully nice and dry. Now there's the river. So sometime soon we gotta finish descending, and there'll be a footbridge we cross to the aid station. This section is taking forever. How are you doing? We're grabbing your back. Great. I'm gonna sit down. Okay, I'll bring it to you. <laughs> Thanks. Oh. <sighs> that is mine. Thanks. I changed my shoes here and put on a dry shirt. This is also where you would grab your headlamp for the night, but I already had mine in my pack from the start. You wearing clothes in there? <laughs> I also taped up my feet for some preemptive blister prevention. And then it was time to head out. But first, I grabbed some ice to put in my hat. I'm checking out. That's me. Thank you. Ice in the hat. Alright, starting the big climb up. Two jaws at the top. So I'm told it can get very cold once night falls and we get near the top. So I've got a long sleeve tucked in here and a windbreaker on my back so I can put those on later if it gets too cold. Race started at 9 a.m. It's now 5.30 p.m. I just took my first pee of the day. And it was not clear. You're welcome. Oh, it's just beautiful here. So I left Footbridge Aid Station about 5.15. When I get up to the top, it should be around midnight, and then head back down. When I get back to Footbridge, that'll be 5 a.m. at the earliest, probably closer to 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. So, we'll see. Gradually starting to climb, and it's about to get a lot steeper. Hearing some thunder. This could get interesting. Why are we here? Cathedral? Somebody saw a bear back there. Well, there's bears here, there's mountain lions, we saw a juvenile a bull moose. Getting some light rain, but I got my raincoat if it gets worse. I'm soaked with sweat anyway, it doesn't matter right now. Coming up on Leaky Mountain. Oh, maybe you're gonna sign to tell me that. Apparently there's about a hundred springs coming out of it. There's a new bridge up here they just finished yesterday. It's all the water coming down from Leaky Mountain. And we were gonna have to cross it with a rope, but I'm told the bridge is, oh, there we go. Now, you should never drink out of a stream without a filter. So I should probably get a filter. It was just so refreshing, I couldn't help myself, but I drank way too much. 227. I don't even want to get back to the oh, I needed to sit down at Spring Marsh for a bit. After drinking way too much water, I was feeling nauseous. How are you feeling? Oh, been better. Uh, oh, can you have noodles? Please, noodles. Awesome. Do you mind? No. I saw the race leader come in heading in the other direction at mile 56, and I was at mile 40. I might not catch him. I also needed to sit because I was starting to feel some pain in my left shin, which had me a little worried. There was nothing I could do about it, I just hoped it didn't get worse. Oh. Thanks guys. 
was Spring Marsh Aid Station. I'm about halfway up the big climb after I drank in that creek. Too much water, nothing in my belly. I got nauseous for a bit, but I had a bunch of noodles and food here, so feeling better. Put my jacket on, it's starting to cool down and get a little windy. All right, time to go. Almost headland time. It's getting dark. A little bit. Are those lights the aid station? Perfect. Thank you. There you go. Aid station off in the distance. So now I got four and a half miles to go up to the top. Okay, here comes the snow. Good job. Awesome, and your name is? Morgan. Morgan, come on in. Okay. How are you feeling? Okay. Good. Cold Welcome feet. To Jaws. Thank you. Two two seven. Two two seven. Two, two, seven. Thank you. We'll help you out here. All right. He's got your drop back. Awesome. Let's take that back. A lot of people were wrecked at Jaws. Some people were throwing up, others were sleeping on cots. They really know how to throw a party up here. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah. How are you feeling? Eh, not bad. Thank you very much. There's a lot of snow, eh? I wasn't expecting that much. I decided not to change any clothes, so I wasn't at Jaws very long. Randy showed up to wait for Mike, so we chatted for a bit. Then it was time to head back out into the snow. So I just left Jaws. I got there at midnight and left at about 12.25. Not bad. I had to get some food and rest for a minute. Just going through snow and slushy, freezing, muddy water from the snow runoff. So I was gonna change my socks while I was there, but there's absolutely no point because they're just getting soaked again. Eventually, the snow thinned out and I kept trekking alone in the dark all by myself. Or so I thought. What are the odds that I'm gonna see a moose on the course anyway? A few minutes ago, I was crossing a field and a giant moose came trotting out right in front of me about 20 feet away. He had uh, no concern for me though, he just trotted off into the woods. Scared the heck out of me though. At least it wasn't a bear. Alright. You guys still have canned peaches? Yes. <laughs> my favorite. Yeah. Can I squeeze in here? Heck yeah. Whoa. Man, I wiped out in some mud. It's not coming off. Into Spring Marsh at 3:30 a.m. I don't believe that's 3.5 miles. That took forever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. My painful shin was making the downhills very slow, so any time predictions were out the window by now. 5:30 a.m. Light has returned. Still descending. Going into footbridge at 7 a.m. Hello. 227. 227. Perfect, that's the one. Thank you. Oh, how you doing? Is this you that I'm needling? No. It's not? Don't touch me. <laughs> oh. The foot lady had the wrong customer. I did need to take care of my feet though. They were doing okay, just dirty and damp, but no blisters. think if we can finish this race, we can do Western States. Oh yeah. 
If you can get in. If you can get in. Yeah, first I need to finish this race to even qualify. After letting my feet dry up, I retaped them and put on my mostly dry shoes. I'd rested too long here and my shin was tightening up. So after some food and coffee, it was time to get going. All right, I just left the footbridge. I was there way too long, but I had to take care of my feet and get some food. Use the porta potty, all sorts of stuff. My left shin is killing me, so I can't really go downhill without massive pain. But it's mostly climbing on the way back. And I, there's that one giant hill to go down near the end, but I brought one Advil today. Perfect. Often during a race, something that's painful will reach a point where it hurts like hell. But the hell remains constant and this is actually reassuring because you know you're not injuring yourself or causing any long-term damage, as long as it doesn't get worse. This got worse. Oh, the downhills are excruciating on my shin. So I'll just power through the uphills and make up some time. Yell and scream on the downhills. Do that for another 10 hours or so and I'll be done. After climbing the wall out of Sally's, heading along the rolling ridges to Dry Fork was exhausting as the temperature climbed up hotter than the day before, somewhere in the high 90s. Or in Celsius, that converts into hot as f Fortunately, I had company for most of this section. This is John, we've been running what, last few hours together through the heat. While editing this video, I discovered that I actually started the race with John as well. Nope, that's Scott Jurek trying to take my picture. And there he is. Okay, back to the madness. We never did find that spring. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Next time. Yeah. Dry fork. It was fun. All right. When we got to Dry Fork Aid Station, they were actually serving McDonald's, which I'd never seen at a race before. The problem was they had to heat it up for you. So I tried some reheated hash browns and french fries, but they weren't going down. Now, if I was ever going to drop, this was the place to do it. There were vehicles here, and in a couple hours, I could be back relaxing at the Super Wheat. But, as a wise man once said, quitting is quitting. So, before carrying on, I let myself rest for 20 minutes. But that was just enough time for my shin to completely seize up. I knew it would loosen up, I just had to get moving again. Just leaving Dry Fork Aid Station. Uh, 17.5 more miles to go. My shin is killing me, I can't even walk properly anymore. Hopefully it loosens up a bit. Get a bit of a climb, and then a dip, and a climb, and then the big massive drop. So I'll take my Advil at the top there. And hopefully that gets me down the hill. Good stuff. Hot. Much hotter than yesterday. There we go. Snow in the hat. Sweet. All right, I just left Upper Creek Aid Station. I'm heading toward the top of the big hill, and we'll have an Advil. See if I can get to the bottom. It's gonna be rough. For the last 12 hours, I'd been dreading how I was gonna get down this final hill. I had my one Advil to take, but I was so scared I was gonna lose it, I actually sat down to take it. The problem was, I'd grossly underestimated how much effort was involved in trying to get back up again. But literally as I was sitting there, I heard someone call my name and I turned to see Randy and Mike coming over the top at the perfect time. Randy helped me back on my feet, but then I told them to go on ahead while I figured out how I was going to get myself down. I tried heading down the hill by sidestepping. I tried with my left foot turned out, which didn't hurt as much, but turns out the least painful way was to actually walk backwards down the hill. Imagine you're in this race running downhill and you pass some guy who's walking backwards while filming himself. I would have looked like an idiot, so I couldn't bring myself to do it. 
Eventually the Advil kicked in and my shin started to loosen up and I was able to turn around and head down the hill like a normal person. By the time I got to the bottom, I was ready to start moving and get this thing done. All right, I made it to the bottom of the hill. The Advil helped big time. Still hurt, but it numbed the pain enough that I could get down the mountain. Now I have to run along the river for a little bit before joining some dirt roads into town to the finish. The whole thing's about eight miles or so. On these flatter miles, I picked up the pace and eventually caught up to Randy and Mike. All right, we're heading in, heading in. the last five mile stretch. Come on, Randy. Randy's pacing Mike. Mike, what number? 100 is this for you? You can give me that finish line, it'll be 186. <laughs> you can give me that finish line, it'll be 186. 186 100 mile finishes. I think Mike has a problem. For now, let's just get this one done. Oh, we're not there yet, so you're still 185. That's right. So another, I don't know, two and a half miles to go? Apparently. All right, almost there. Coming into the finish of any long goal race always feels special. That's because it doesn't feel like the end of a race. It feels like the end of an adventure. It started months ago with planning, logistics, all the training, the prep races, even the travel. The race is really just the last chapter of the story. Later, only you'll be able to answer whether everything you went through was worth it. But for now, as you take those last few steps, the only thing left to do is enjoy the moment. Yeah, I enjoyed the moment, but was it worth it? Well, my shin and ankle were swollen for a few weeks, and I had to pull out of my next three races, including another 100 miler. It also pretty much ruined my summer and my soccer season. But was it worth it? If you go to the Hard Rock website and scroll through the entrance, you won't find me. I was denied for the eighth time. As for Western States, well, if you saw my last video, you would have seen this. 16 ticket count from Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. Oh, oh. Morgan Schick. So yes, totally worth it. This will actually be 10 years from the first time I ran Western States, so I'm really looking forward to going back. Well, thanks for watching. I should probably be out training somewhere, but Never mind. Now get lost. Mm -hmm.